Yeah, Wendy Stevenson, and um, I'm working with an organization called The Converging World. And actually, it started out um, as an us community, in a way, because of how it started. So essentially, what we do is we invest in renewable energy in India. And that seems a very long, long way from the community of Bristol. But it actually started in um, Chumagna, just over the hill, with the Go Zero project there. And a um, fabulous project where people were talking about how do we reduce waste to zero? How do we reduce carbon emissions to zero? And there was a carbon offsetting company that came and said, you know, it'd be way more cost effective if you actually you know, put light bulbs into townships in South Africa or somewhere like that, and um, it'll be much more cost effective in terms of reducing climate change. And some people said, really? We want to help our community here. Um, and not only that, with the rate at which India and China are developing, what use is it? Us doing anything, really. So with that, most people went home, but a few people got together and said, well, why don't we try and meet an Indian or Chinese community that we can work together on climate change? Um, and that was it. That was the start of it. And that was um, the us community bit, if you like. And serendipity had it not long after the tsunami. A filmmaker was going there and, um, uh, to India to film. And they said, I'll put you in touch. And then there was a trip. And then we found it was the windiest place in India. It was John Pontin, actually, that went out there and said, I've got an idea, or we've got an idea. Let's invest in renewable energy there, leapfrog the developments that we've had. There's a lot of carbon, a lot of potential to build more coal-fired power stations. There's lots of people still off-grid. So let's invest, use money from here, invest in renewable energy there, and use the profit for social and environmental initiatives. And so that's what we do. And 10 years later, um, we've put in three wind farms, and we use the profit for social and environmental initiatives. And we're particularly focusing on reforestation. And it's bottom up, partly because of the CO2 uh, sequestration, but also because of the value that forests bring in every other way. It's not just about CO2 removal from the atmosphere, um, but it's also about the well-being, it's about livelihoods, it's about local water management, biodiversity, and the list goes on. And it's the most cost-effective way to remove CO2 from the atmosphere. I think we sometimes get a bit distracted by all this technology and green bling and, and, and more policy papers telling us things we've already known for the last 40 years. We could just plant more trees. And, um, <laughs> yes. and, and actually, when you look at it, so even putting renewable energy in India, we know we can put in a megawatt there, which is half or a third of the price per megawatt it is here, and we avoid twice as much CO2 emissions. So um, I don't want to see it as, we can sometimes get very parochial about this, but it, as a globe, it doesn't matter where that ton of CO2 is emitted, it's going to affect, it's going to have the same effect anywhere. So yes, we've got to do it here, we've got to start here, but I think we shouldn't be put off by something that is just out of sight. So that's what we do at the Converging yeah. World. How is it that people investing in Converging World, do they rete receive any financial returns or how is that gonna move forward? Um, well, we, we experimented. At first it was donation um, as a model. Um, and um, that kind of worked for a while. And then the crowdfunding kind of happened. And so we went through that phase. And we wanted to, to democratize, if you like, investment. Because a lot of people, I find, a lot of individuals want to do something. They want to look at where they can put their money. So we experimented with democratizing that through crowdfunding. And we aimed it actually so that students of Bristol could actually invest. And they could lend us a fiver and we'd pay them 6% and they get the fiver back after five years. And you know, we raised enough money to put in a wind farm. And, um, and so that was fabulous. And then we grew up a little bit more because we wanted to grow a little bit bigger because we thought, well, we're still paying off Indian banks and we want to sort of put more money into reforestation and things. And so this takes us to a whole area and what I'm really interested in is, is the barriers. So. There's, there are rules and regulations, and they've come from a good place, around actually 
offering investments. And it's fabulous what's happened in this country around community investment into community renewables, but there are a lot of rules and regulations around that. So it's not easy for me to just go and say, lend us a fiver again, and, and, and get the response that we need to be able to accelerate what we need on the planet. And it's kind of this tension between how much time have we got and how long is it going to take me to raise this money? Now, if lots of people would come out or lots of charities um, would, would come out and say, yep, we actually want to take this back. I'll give you an example. In India, we have big city funds like Goldman Sachs and JP Morgan all investing hugely into renewable energy. In itself, it's not bad. And not everybody is a criminal in, in, in the city. You know, we are human. Everyone is human. But the business model is predicated on how much money can I make when I sell that wind farm. It's not, it doesn't come out of the place. We need renewable energy because we need a future for the, uh, for the people there and, and, and here, and we need this for future generations. Yeah. And if it comes from a better place, then that would be great. But it's very expensive to access that kind of funding, and so that's one of the barriers. To list a company on AIM, it will cost you at least a million pounds. So, it's not easy. We don't have an offer open at the moment, but you know, when we do, then we'll let you know. <laughs> but it's, um, it's quite a difficult process. So what is AIM and what would be listing on AIM? Okay, so this is, you'd, you'd have a company and you would, um, so it, just like in, in a lot of the community schemes here, people would buy a share of that company for a pound or 50p or 10 pounds, and then they get to own, they have ownership. And so if it's um, participatory uh, democracy, then it means that, as we see it, the commons will own, if you like. So shouldn't it be that the commons own these things rather than you know, just some very rich uh, fundraisers and that whole system there just making more money and accumulating wealth? So How do we democratize that? So, you're say, so you've got a, a charity that you've worked on uh, that is work, investing in renewable energy. Yes. That is putting the proceeds of that investment into community through reforestation. And the process of floating on AIM, therefore, means that people can be investing in something that has this product yes. of going into re, uh, reforestation. That's right. So the charity exists and we set up a company that would allow individuals to uh, be um, owners of that too. So it's the charity is the majority shareholder and then individuals. And it's that company that we are looking to list so we can raise more money to put into more renewable energy that will go into reforestation. And why would you choose to go into dealing with the financial markets at all? People said that to me when I, I worked in Westminster with the manufacturers. Um, it's an interesting one. We have tried for many years to raise funds to grow that market, to grow that market, um, to, um, to put in more renewable energy, to invest in more renewable energy, so that we can use that money for reforestation as well as pro provide a financial return. And we have hit barrier after barrier after barrier. And I'll pitch this here now because we're at a university. For example, Lots of universities and lots of charities have policy committees, and those committees um, will have uh, restrictions around what they can invest in. And it's quite a challenge because lots have come out and said, we're not going to invest in fossil fuel or we're not going to invest in this. But it's very, unless that committee proactively then looks for solid projects to invest in where um, you know, they're going to get the returns that they need, where it's going to do good, then you'll just hit storm walls. So and that policy needs to change. So you're saying country. that by creating this model, you're able to create a situation where people can be investing in reforestation? Yes, because the IPCC report said we absolutely need more reforestation. How do we do that? And How are people going to do that? Another, one of the things that I'm really aware that you've pinpointed in terms of both the IPPC support and also the implementation of those Kyoto Protocol targets is that when we hear about news reports um, referring to becoming uh, carbon zero by 2050, uh, there's very little reference, well, there's a lot of reference to the need to cut emissions 
but there's very little reference to the possibility of sequestering the carbon that's already in the upper atmosphere. And so one of the barriers that we're talking about, I wonder if you could say something about that. Yes, yeah, so when, when we look at how, so the work that I did in Westminster was often sitting around very long blah blah regulatory committees that would develop regulations that were meant to bring about and affect change. Now, some of the issues with that was that there was very little in terms of um, practical experience around the table. And when there's not the practical experience, there's therefore often not the imagination or the experience to be able to say, how will that really impact the call, the, what I call the call face, like on the ground? And I, I've seen a lot, so for example, if we look at, we, we know that wind farms for us or renewable energy is just the engine to, it's needed, but it's just the engine to throw off the finances that will help to go into reforestation, which is hard to raise money for. It's green bling at the end of the day compared to we need more forests and it's cost effective. Now, when we take the Kyoto Protocol or when we take the Paris Accord or when we take the Bond Challenge and they talk about getting reforestation into the ground, when it comes to transposing that into regulation, setting mandatory targets for business and, and other institutions here in the UK, it actually works against it. It actually prevents them doing something around carbon neutrality, even if that's not the right way. It forces them into the most expensive solutions. And so it's madness. And, and I remember plan, what, what was it, plan B by Virgin and m and and everybody else came out and said, oh, we can be carbon neutral by 2050. Do it through reforestation and you'll do it by 2020. And what would be the cost ratio between doing it through sequestration? Well, it's about 50 pence, if that, to reduce one tonne of CO2 through tree planting. Whereas if you actually do it with cavity wall insulation, it's about 16 pounds, or it was. If you put in solar power, I remember it used to cost 900 pounds to reduce one tonne of CO2. I mean, that's a few years ago by putting solar panels on the roof. Now, 900 pounds to sequester one, uh, to avoid one tonne of CO2. Now, I'm not saying we don't need this, we do. But if there's a race against time and we need to put in more forests to help remove because it is one of the only solutions it will remove it the rest just avoid it and it's expensive so it, it's so it's common sense and so how do we do it yeah well I think identifying those barriers and working on how to shift shift them and articulate amongst the global general public that those are things that we need to be shifted sounds like a really good move yeah. Absolutely. I mean, I'm, I'm also interested as well in the, um, the disconnect. I mean, wh why is it that we don't connect with this? You know, we become so separate. If you don't know Charles, the work of Charles Eisenstein, I recommend you, you, you read him. And he talks about the age of separation. And, and, and that's the age we've been living through, where we're so disconnected from the natural world that we don't feel it. And, you know, we don't... How can you care for something you know, if you don't love it. You know, if we love it, we care for it. And I, I feel very lucky that I went into this because I care and I love the environment. And for me, it feels like self-harm, what we're doing. And um, I'm just interested, Susie, because you have been a school teacher. And I'm really interested to know, because I think it starts very young. We're, we're driven by targets and performance very early on, and we move away from that. In your experience, how is this been seen to play out in the classroom in your experience? Well I mostly deal with secondary um, so while I have small children um, I do actually, I see a lot of amazing work happening in primary schools and there is a lot of issues around pressure and targets and not spending enough time outside and all of that but actually secondary schools are my main area of concern with that with regards to the connection with nature and I think the main thing that I notice is that we have a method of teaching and training people to understand about objective science, which asks them to look at something, objectify it, classify it, and then pass a judgment on some kind of sliding scale between good or bad, or like and dislike, or useful and not useful to me. And then at that point, once they've done that kind of classification, judgment, they can put it to one side. Now, if that's a tree, what they've done is effectively objectify it. Like, you could argue that people objectify women. They haven't actually understood a great deal about that thing in front of them. And I think, um, really, in a way, 
both our science and our education has the, in the desire to cram full of facts, we've possibly almost educated people out of being able to really listen to the natural world and to accept or to understand that it may have something that it wants to tell us in reality. I mean, like these things might be able to be communicating with us and communicating with us about how to take care of the earth and the ecosystems. And so, yeah, I think that, you know, pinpoint that would be one of my major issues. Do you want to just tell us a little bit more about the, um, the work that you're doing now around that and some of the people you're in touch with? Yeah, okay. <laughs> Um, so, I, the process of having small children, I found quite isolating. Maybe I was a little bit alienated from my culture. Um, and a part of how I coped with that was um, I went and sat with trees. And I found that I got a lot of support. And I found I was able to process my emotions in a way that made, helped me to make sense of things. I started to notice that when I was sitting with different trees, I was getting different themes of thoughts and ideas, and I started following and researching those thoughts and ideas, and found that there is some really amazing um, ecosystems science going on out there. I found, the work, I found Claire Dubois, the Tree Sisters, which you're intimately involved with. I found um, Diana Beresford Kroger, um, extraordinary revelations around how when trees are producing oxygen, they're not just producing oxygen, they're producing all sorts of minute part aerosols that are medicating the upper atmosphere and helping cloud seeding. When we talk about all these various different cloud seeding, understanding that trees are actually doing that in this extraordinary way and medicating the waters and the earth. Like these huge pumping uh, columns of, of this sort of ex extremely rich sort of perfume and chemicals into the atmosphere to bene benevolently. Um, and once I started finding out about how extraordinary modern, science, modern um, research is around trees, around ecosystems, I also started finding out that there's some amazing regeneration projects. There's the wilding projects, there's projects working with regeneration with the soil and then planting. Um, and there are globally the most astonishing number of these projects all over the world, amazing methods. I got so excited. And, uh, and it is actually a bit hard for your family and friends if all you want to talk about is trees all the time. <laughs> <laughs> so I arranged a conference so I could meet all the people I was really interested in <laughs> and talk to them about trees. Um, and I was also really, really interested in highlighting their work. Um, so that's what we did last year. And it went really well um, because the opportunity to provide a forum where it was both conservationists and foresters who don't necessarily see eye to eye about which trees to plant. There's some big issues around whether or not it's okay to have Sitka spruce um, or whether it's okay to have cash crop timber um, and then there is and what to plant for climate change and then there's also the scientists who maybe struggle a little bit with the idea that there are tree empaths and there are people out there who do have a direct connection with nature and that they do learn that way um, so what we did is provide a safe space for all of those different voices and expertise to come together with artists, with creatives, with project leaders and community people who are just really excited about what they can be doing in their local community. And it was really nourishing. It was really nourishing for the scientists for there to be, you know, we had Isla McLeod, who's a tree speaker. She sat on the panel and was able to articulate her experience with trees, how she had gone through university. She had felt incredibly alienated. She had come out of that experience really feeling very lost about who she was. She was very intel intelligent. She did really well when she was younger, but she just couldn't make sense of what was going on. She went and spent quite a lot of time in the woods and developed this incredibly deep connection with trees. And, and so we had her there with Professor Sir David Reed. Um, Professor Emeritus, but still, at, at, you know, uh, the author of Combating Climate Change, A Role for UK Forests, um, which is a seriously important uh, piece of work around what the climate predictions are for the circumstances that trees will receive in 50 years that we're planting now. So the understanding that just planting what would do well now isn't necessarily kind for something that lives... 100, 200, 300, in the case of ewes, maybe three, you know, 2,000, 3,000 years. So, um, so bringing them all together, and it was great, the scientists having the experience that somebody was actually saying trees were conscious and that they could communicate, 
and it was really great for the project leaders to discover that they could get their heads around the science, mm. and it was okay for them to, you know, to realize it was interesting, it's all doable, it's all actually really rather interesting. <laughs> and the community um, sort of uh, council sort of organizing groups to see that actually there was a tremendous amount of support for what they were trying to put in through the neighborhood plans, which I'm quite keen on. Hmm. Some of that local, local level legislation, and in particularly with regards to what's been happening in the States about how they've, it's really been the only level. It seems like they've been able to take on the powers that have been given to corporate in entities. Hmm. Um, which are a major part of where I'm interested in. After last year's conference, I felt in my bones that it is possible to halt deforestation of ancient growth forests. Um, and there are legislative ways of doing that, particularly making it a crime in the international courts of law. Yeah. We all need to be really articulating this to other people. There are strategies for halting ancient growth deforestation and we do need to be really clear and about articulating what we want to see on that level. And also at a local level, mm. um, you know, when it is we see things like forest ecosystems and therefore it's really hard to say, oh, well, how do you call that ecocide if you cut down one tree at a time? Maybe when does it become ecocide? Um, but what seems to be a difficulty for them is to acknowledge forests as, give them rights as entities. Mm. And yet they can do that to a corporation. Well, and that's where that thing of it's so easy when you're in a culture that's so visual mm. um, to think that what you're seeing in front of you is what it is. And I think that's what we've really learned around our relationship with women, that how the 2D image has objectified women mm. um, and what we actually know they're capable of and the depths and the, the brilliance. It, it's almost the case that that 2D image completely confuses you about what a woman actually is, her role within the community, her role within the family, her role spiritually to, mm -hmm. to long for the earth that she needs for her family, for her community. And I think it's similar with the natural world. Yeah, yeah. And we've got very cut on what I would almost call sort of tree porn. So uh, we're now going to go into Q&A. There's a couple of things I want to say about that. Uh, this. It would be great if you could just introduce yourself. You don't have to give the whole what you do and all the rest, but at least your name so that we can um, get a sense of, uh, of who we're talking to. Can you ask them to put the lights on? Yeah, yeah, I'll get them to do that in a second. Um, so, uh, and then the second thing is, there's quite a lot of you out there, so what would be great is if you can ask your question or make your comment and keep it as short as you possibly can. Think about you know, what it is that you want to communicate. Do that, and then if you could give the mic back to one of, we've, only, we've got two mics and two runners. So if you could give it back to them, that'll enable them to then move it on to um, the next person. So that would be great. And could you change the lights around for me now? Please. Whoa, you do exist. Hooray. Hello. Cool. Lots of people. There's people. Could we have ours down a tiny bit more as well? You don't need to see us, really. No. OK, great. That's even better. Thank you. Um, and the third and final thing I wanted to say before we start this um, is it'd be great. I'd, I'd really like, or we'd like um, two or three women to be asking questions first. And if, if that's, uh, if, I can explain that to you why I want that to happen later if you want. But we'll have the first two or three questions from women, please. So the floor is now yours. A woman on the end. Hooray. And a microphone immediately behind you. Go for it. Who are you? Hi, I'm Natasha. And I am studying the coastal commons. Um, and I'm interested to know whether uh, you have read Christopher Stone's book from 1970s called Should Trees Have Standing? And it's about giving legal personality to nature. And I'm looking at the possibility of giving legal standing to the coast. And the question is, as we're, as we're seeing in Froome and in the River Dart in Devon as well, there are potential mechanisms of giving legal personality to nature. But we can't do that without people making the connection and maybe people representing nature the river, the tree, the wood, the coast. Um, how and what techniques do we need to facilitate that linkage? Thank you. I need to give that mic back. So you're right with that. Do you want to take that, Susie? Well, whichever of you wants to, really. Can I just say something else? That I don't know whether it's going to be possible to twist. Um, you won't hear at all if we twist one of those mics. It's quite difficult for us to hear. Yeah. So you'll need to be really clear, because we haven't got the mics coming this direction. But we've got that. Thanks. Go for it. 
Um, the most recent sort of update on Christopher Stone's book, which is brilliant, is uh, David Boyd. Mm, I'm wanting to hope I've got that right. Uh, the Rights of Nature, and that came out last year. You can get it on audiobook as well. And he has ma now gone forward to support the UN in their understanding of the application of the rights of nature. And um, he, he really, has, really brings along the debate, including really up-to-date um, information on legal cases. And one of the, w w some of the key ones I'd highlight to you would be um, the case in New, New Zealand with the Maoris. Um, where they've uh, gone a long way towards not just uh, protecting um, certain lands, but doing it very specifically by articulating their ancestral relationship with the land as the land as their ancestor, and also the recognition of the visible and invisible beings that they're intimately connected with in that landscape. And so another one I'd really profile would be the Sariaku and the Living Forest Declaration, which the Ecuadorian people are looking to have um, uh, acknowledged by in other countries but it's a particularly brilliant three-page document uh, which goes a really long way of expressing that relationship between nature and humans uh, in such a way as we can have the discussion around whether we can cope with the idea that there might be some really cool clever things in nature and move on quite directly with how we can start to legislate for that but there are quite a few different examples now of that happening and another one's Cormac Cullinan who also charts the different places in the country where in the in the globe where there's been some really significant investments with that. Okay, thank you. Do you want to add something? Th yeah. This ties in with um, a, a, a necessary step in any effective conservation or rewilding project, which is it has to have a community development component in it. And any project that you try to engage in, the ecology is the easy bit. You know, if you, if you want to bring back trees, you, you can plant, plant trees. trees. In fact, you don't even have to plant them in a lot of places. Mm. You just stop the grazing or something and they come back. But the, the crucial thing is always to have, not just have people's consent, but active involvement and ownership of the project, whatever it might be. And there's a, a great example now um, in, in the UK um, um, of trying to do this at a very large scale where this group that I was involved in setting up called Rewilding Britain has just launched his Summit to Sea program, um, going from Pimlimmon, the highest point of Mid Wales, um, all the way down through the lowlands, um, across the estuaries, and out um, in Cardigan Bay, a huge area of land and sea, which they're hoping to rewild, but doing so entirely through the work of the community. And so the community becomes the driver of it, becomes the owner of it, um, it, it's, it's, uh, and the whole idea is that you are regenerating um, communities, you are helping people to find jobs and income in a place where there's almost no jobs and income, you're greatly diversifying the economy, and the whole thing is built around um, creating a much richer set of natural ecosystems than we have at present. And you okay. have to have the people at the core of it. You can't if you try to protect nature without at the same time giving people something which improves their lives, it is going to fail. Thanks. Okay. So um, there, now I, what I promised to do to, the, to our roving mics was do what I'm going to do now, which is say, so the lady with the pink top and then over, can you come all the way around? Oh, you can run around there, can't you? So you're the next one on the end there. Yeah, thank you. And then I'll get the next one after so we can not have so much running. Hello. Hi, I'm Heather. Um, I am currently experiencing the idea that I am not doing enough for the environment. And I think I speak for many people in this room when I say that. Um, you guys, I see as doing so much, and I am so grateful. I find this guilt an immobilizing force, and it's one of my barriers. So I would like to know whether you guys have had this feeling. And, ha and tips for overcoming hmm. that for all of us here. Fine question. <laughs> Top tips. Hmm. I think the um, short answer is yes. <clears throat> and I think one never feels one is doing enough. Um, but I, it, it's great to identify it as a barrier. And I think just... 
there's lots of things we can do from you know looking at what we consume and how we consume that to um, you know all the whether or not you cycle to work walk to work whether or not you take how many journeys you take and I, I keep coming back having worked in this sector for nearly 30 years and heard the same policies regurgitated over and over again is how do we make this happen? And I think it really comes back to a shift internally in our being about who we are, really knowing ourselves, reconnecting back with ourselves, and that's heart over mind, really connecting back there, and then really feeling and connecting back with nature because we are one with nature, and we become completely separate from it. And when we do that, I think we start to become stiller. And I think we fly around the planet not just in aeroplanes, but even just because we can, we get in the car and drive to London for a party or we drive back to wherever, and we do it because we can and it's expected of us because we can. But I think there's something to be said to being much more stiller in our lives, in every way really, and to bring back the magic and the creativity and the space. Because I see children with large backpacks going to school who are driven by the same targets that drive the capitalist market and we're t churning out little automatons to add to that machine. So how do we step out of it? Hmm. <laughs> Thanks, Andy. Okay. Peter, could I... Could, okay, yeah, yeah. Could I add something to Quickly. This? Um, look, I, I feel guilt all the time. I mean, being active, spending my whole life on these things doesn't relieve it. And in a way, we ought to. You know, who, who, what, what do we call people who don't feel guilt? Psychopaths. We should feel guilt, but the guilt we should feel is a sort of structural guilt, not an individual guilt. Mm. Because the whole thrust of the system at the moment is to blame us for structural forces. Mm. We, we were talking about this before. You know, you, your credit card is maxed out. Well, nothing to do with the fact that your housing costs are impossible. It's because you're feckless. You haven't got a job, it's nothing to do with the fact that there's structural unemployment, it's because you're unenterprising. You feel uh, you, you're behaving in a bad way towards the, the living world, but it's nothing to do with the fact that we live in a total saturated consumerist society, it's because you're a bad person. That's the way it, it works. We're, we're all, it's all loaded onto us as individuals in this highly individuated ideology called neoliberalism, in fact, called capitalism, because capitalism itself drives towards individuation. And so we, we, what we have to see is that the guilt we have to accept is a societal guilt, not an individual guilt. Mm. And the forces we have to take on, of course we have to change our own behavior and we have to constantly address it and question it, but the real forces we have to take on, which enable us to change our behavior far more effectively, are structural forces, are the economic forces, are the political forces. Mm. That's why we have to get political and why we can't just do this as consumers, we can only do it as citizens. Mm. Thank you. Sorry, sorry I tried to hurry you up because that was really important. <laughs> Susie, you wanted to add a tiny thing. My tiny bit is how massive we are, and in that moment when you still, and you give yourself the space to really tune into you, it's not just guilt, it's grief. And the grief won't go away, um, probably for the next couple of generations, because we're going to lose so much. Um, and, uh, but getting to, coming to terms with that and, and coming into community around supporting each other around that, um, I think is actually deeply empowering in terms of t tuning into what your gifts are and what it is that you feel motivated to do and y how you play your role and, and how, how you can be really brave and stand up really, really big on that. Thank you. Right. Thank you. I'm sorry, just before you start, um, let's have someone somewhere else over there. Okay, right over there near the speaker. With the brand. Uh, uh, yeah, after this lady. Uh, I'm Rachel from Bradford on Avon, um, currently working with our local climate change zero carbon by 2050 group. But formerly, I was in international development, working to help vulnerable communities adapt to climate change and attending the UN climate conferences. So I wanted to talk about. Um, the reforestation that Wendy talked about, and bearing in mind what George said about the importance 
of community ownership of forests. Um, and the challenge that when people do have access to trees, they often don't have the ownership. You know, they've got use of land, but somebody else owns the trees on that land. So there are structural challenges about reforestation. First, you know that communities in many parts of the world getting ownership or you know, being allowed to look after the trees. But the other thing is there's this insidious process of countries and corporations trying to offset their own emissions by buying land elsewhere and planting plantation forests, which are not the way to sequester the best carbon, and expropriating people because government's saying, oh, nobody uses this land. But of course they do. Pastoralists, for example, with their um, livestock on land that has trees on it. So what I want to understand is I, I totally accept that one way to get out of the mess we're in on climate change could be mass reforestation. But how can that practically happen when we've got so many people on so much of the land actually using it already? Wendy. Um, well, I, I think it goes back to what George was saying and also uh, what Susie mentioned and that you've actually raised. So thank you for raising that. Um, it must be connected with community. And it, <coughs> it must not be mass plantation of monocultures because it does very little for biodiversity. Um, the projects that we... Um, work with and um, I'll give you an example w w one of our um, uh, reforestation projects runs along the southeast of India on the Comorandal coast and there they, it used to be a thousand kilometers by 30 kilometers of tropical dry evergreen forest and today there are four, less than four hectares of full climax forest left that's had a massive impact on the local population it's, the area is rain-fed, not river-fed. And because it's rain-fed and because of the mass deforestation, it means that the waters run off the soil and the soil goes with it and it goes into the sea and then the soil can no longer support life. Not only that, increasing sea level salinates the water table. The locals looking for water don't always understand, so they will go through the salinated um, aquifer into the next one and polluting that one. And within 10 years, that area of over 700 square kilometers could actually be um, a, a, a place that you just wouldn't be able to live in. It wouldn't support life. What has happened is that just a handful of people, a handful of people, started by collecting seeds from the sacred groves because the trees tended to live around the temples. They tended to be left there. They collected seeds and started to germinate them with indigenous, um, for, uh, indigenous plants and, for, and trees. And from that, they started to grow the forest. Then a women's cooperative was initially set up where the women who absolutely needed access to funds for their family and to support their family, because unfortunately, if it, often the men would drink and gamble, and therefore it wouldn't, if you, give the, if you give the livelihood to the woman, it's more likely to help with education and, and, and everything else, as you may know. Um, women's Cooperative was set up, and they actually um, germinate the seeds, they've set up a nursery, they've set up a second nursery, and they are actually then, bu we're buying the saplings back from them, a guaranteed amount for replanting, and then they are paid for two years to maintain those saplings so that there's a 90% success rate, which is much higher than the government reforestation. Because of the work that's going on there, they are now educating other states in India about ecological restoration. It's not reforestation, it's ecological restoration. And so it's, people often say that, well, how do you guarantee that that forest will live on? Because people are interested in the CO2 reduction. Of course they are. But that's not the only thing. And so social fencing is a term that's been, uh, that, that, that is used because also uh, there, there's work going on with 170 schools in that area around the importance of ecological restoration and how important nature is to them. So it has to be hand in hand. It can't mm. be mass monoculture plantation. I agree. Thank yeah. you. Okay. So we're going over there, and who's going to be after that? Okay, well, oh, hang on a sec. Let's go, I'll just go in the middle there, and then I'll come to you one after. So have you got that one? There's a lady I can't quite see. In the middle somewhere. Yeah. 
fair hair. Over there. Hi, my name's Rasheen. Whoa. Um, thanks for this, it's been really great. Um, I work at the SU in Campaigns, uh, Bristol Students' Union. Um, I'm really interested in what you said about kind of economic transformation and working to build the commons. Um, but something that I've struggled with, and I'm sure a lot of people have, is that you, in order to survive in the current economy, you have to spend and dedicate so much of your life just to having a nine to five job or longer to get by. And it takes a lot of time to build the communities that you say are like necessary to enable commons and participatory democracy and participatory budgeting. Um, how do you see, I guess on a broad scale, how do you see that transformation taking place when we have an economy where people need to spend the majority of their waking hours just surviving? And then on an individual level, do you have any like advice or tips for if you only have a small amount of brain space and a small amount of time in your week to dedicate to a project, what's the most valuable thing that you can do towards building a new economy? Thank you, thank you very much. This is a, a crucial question and beautifully articulated, thank you. Um, in Britain, the key thing is housing. I mean, we are, how many people in this audience pay rent? How many people spend more than 30% of their income on rent? More than 40%? Anyone more than 50% perhaps? A couple? <laughs> This is extraordinary. Basically, you are giving this money to someone who doesn't have to work at all. You are giving 30% or 40% or in a couple of cases 50% of all your working time to someone who can spend their entire life on a beach because you, you are subsidizing them. You are paying for them not to work. This is a grotesque situation which we have normalized. We just, it's like, you know, one of those many things that it becomes the, the water in which we swim, we don't see it, even though it is a grotesque injustice. And what has happened is that the land on which housing sits has become this speculative investment for buy-to-let landlords, often operating at a vast scale, hundreds or thousands of homes in some cases, um, which are, as far as they're concerned, they are simply a cash cow to be milked often appalling conditions for which you are paying huge amounts of money. So we have to deal, I, I, and, and I think this is absolutely crucial, and it might seem completely disconnected from environmental issues, from all the other stuff we're talking about. We have to deal with the fact that people are paying so much for their housing. We have to deal with the fact that people are being exploited by economic rentiers, basically taking money for nothing. And so with a bunch of very smart people, I'm working on a um, report on basically how we can do this, how we can make housing much, much cheaper than it is today, how we can curb the power of the landlords, how we can actually make even buying houses much more affordable, bring it down to 30% of current costs, that sort of thing. We've got some very interesting, quite exciting proposals coming. I can't, unfortunately, tell you very much about <laughs> it at this stage. Uh, but watch this space. In, 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 a, uh, in a couple of months' time, we'll be able to publish. And I think it has revolutionary potential because it's that exploitation. You know, you could be earning the, the same amount of money in 50% of the time if you weren't giving 50% of it to a landlord and, and having a life to fill with all these other wonderful things. Not just campaigning, it's crucially important, but so are all the other important things. The socializing, the parties, the connecting with nature, all the other things we need to be doing, we are deprived of this time. So many people in the past, Marx, Keynes, many others, foresaw a time when we would hardly have to do any work at all because there would be so much wealth in society. Well, there is all that wealth in society, but it's going straight into the pockets of the landlords. And this is an injustice which we have to overturn. Hmm. Uh, uh, the lady in the middle. Did you get the mic yet? Good. Um, and hi, then I'll come to you at the front. Hi, I'm Liv T. Um, I was wondering, do you think uh, universities could ever be treated as the commons rather than competitive neoliberal like private institutions? Thank you. Good question.
Um, I think it's really fun to imagine universities as being uh, places really that stored knowledge about the universe um, and you really found out about how it worked. Um, I think different land masses have an extraordinary amount to teach to people around the science and the ecosystems of that landmass and universities in different locations. It would be great if they're the way that they worked actually reflected what the wisdom was in that local area that needed to be taught to the people who wanted to move into a position of responsibility and guardianship or look, go to that area to learn from the skills or wisdoms that come from that land mass or continent. So, yeah, I would, um, I'm, I'm definitely quoting, in certain, uh, some aspects of this, Thomas Berry and the great work in terms of um, very strongly wanting to call in that, that we have an education system that really allows people to become their higher selves manifest on the planet um, and, uh, and not, you know, puppets of the state. So, yeah. Thank you. I, I, I would love to see a, a, a move towards the common ownership of learning. I mean, for God's sake, you know, it, it, it is a common resource. And, and we, of course, it's going in completely opposite direction with the sort of um, uh, capitalization, the managerial cultures, the market fundamentalism, the neoliberalism of universities where vice chancellors are scooping up 400,000 quid a year and stuff for running hmm. the institution into the ground. I don't know about this particular one, but that's a general <laughs> trend. Down the road. Which um, seems to be happening while the students are just treated, uh, they're, they're just processed Cash like, like sausages and, mm. and made to pay ridiculous fees. I mean, obviously, there's you know, a problem in that the students are transient. You know, you're only there for three or four years, and so um, the, the sort of control of the resource is slightly harder, but the faculty can certainly control the resource if it is allowed to. And of course, you know, it's, it's all gone wrong, and, and we do need to reclaim um, higher education. And let's have not just universities, let's have diversities. You know, at the moment, they are truly universal, universities in that they're pushing us into just one way of thinking particularly in the economics departments and the business schools, which seem to be taking everything over. Um, it's only one way of looking at the world. And you know, we're seeing a revolt now by economic students saying, sorry, mate, there are far more ways of looking at the world. There are, there are so many ways of, of looking at it through, from an economic perspective which are not about neoliberal or neoclassical economics. We want diversity in our teaching. We do not want university in our teaching. Thank you. Okay. So I know, I know, because I haven't got this quite right, we need to move the mic to the guy at the front here, and then um, the Hamilton House a crew will say a word. And then I really ought to take somebody on this side at the back then. So perhaps we, yeah, there's a, the person, uh, yeah, the person with his hand straight up very powerfully, quite near to you. Yeah, uh, Jay. Um, and then I have to tell you that we're going to need, we're going to need, the, let's keep these kind of really short if you want to get many more in. So, um, you know, we're coming towards what we want to do next for the last few minutes. Where are we? You, sir. Hi. Yeah, I'm Pete. Um, I work um, in the curious position of uh, working with uh, celebrities. Um, I'm a sound engineer. Um, so, I, I, yeah, I'm around them a lot. And um, I've noticed there's a big problem um, with the connection between the celebrities and their fans. So the idolization of the celebrity as an object um, and the disconnect between people um, trying to fix their problems through that idolization of the celebrity. Um, that seems to be a really big problem. Um, and this is driving uh, a force uh, when these fans meet a celebrity, they're not, they're not getting the time to express, they're not expressing truthfully and they, they're not accepting their true power, like you were saying, the higher self. I believe that if they directed those energies inward, then they would naturally get to the point where they would reconnect with nature, they'd reconnect with, with all of these things that seem to be natural things, but they're not happening in our society. So my question would be, how, how do we go about changing that? Because mass marketing and media is so powerful and it's run by the neoliberal um, elite, um, which obviously is going to move towards its own interests. How do we start to like, break down that power? Mm. 
I think you could say neoliberal elite, or you could say a bunch of magicians who are saying, hey, look here, look here, well, at the same time grabbing a whole load of things because your attention's grabbed elsewhere. So don't, like, just don't do that. You know, stay really centered and build a relationship with the natural world around you. Yeah, yeah. And then use the internet and use those things in ways that serve you and what, what you want to do. The, the, the media serves us terribly in this respect. And I have to say, I'm afraid to say that The Guardian falls into the same category. I mean, almost half the major featured interviews in The Guardian are with actors. Why? Hmm. Why are the people we want to hear from people who make their living by impersonating someone else and speaking someone else's words? <laughs> Shouldn't we be hearing from the people who actually originate the words, for a start? Yeah. Look at all the amazing things that people do. Look at these amazing people. Look at these amazing people. Mm. I mean, I'm not saying that actors are all uninteresting. I'm sure there's some very interesting actors, but I'm sure that you're just as interesting as they are. Mm. And I'm sure that some of you have actually had richer life experiences than certain actors who get interviewed everywhere. Why do we do this? Why do we get locked into this? I think if I were to sit down with the editors of The Guardian and ask them why they're doing this, they wouldn't even realize that they'd been doing it. Sure. It, it's because of the saturation effect, because we're completely surrounded in this. So it's incumbent on us who see this, who see that there's a problem, to say we create alternative polarities, we create different ways of being. And of course, you know, we now have far more control through social media. And so sort of, you know, let's, let's get a tweet storm going, say no more celebrity yeah. tweeting. Let's, let's ignore celebrities. Let's just ignore celebrities. Ignore them. So next time you buy The Guardian, take out the... Just, just rip out those yeah. pages. In fact, exactly. rip out all the pages. Except take the out the cooking, because you'll want that. And then, and then chuck the rest, and don't look at it. I went to um, a festival called Bylines Festival the other day, and there was a, a really, really good panel on, um, uh, on Putin and, and Trump, and it was particularly heading into their relationship. And when asked, oh, well, what do I do about this, by one of the audience members at the end, the woman who was Russian, actually, and had spent a fair amount of time in, um, in prison, said, just when you feel your button, you know, your finger hovering over the button, which is going to tell you whatever lie Trump has told next, don't go there, because it's just feeding that whole process. And that's all we as individuals. It goes back a bit to what can I do, you know, what can we do as individuals. Just don't go there, because it, it feeds all that process. So shred the actors in The Guardian. Um, go for it. Hello. Um, my name's Claire. I'm, I'm here with the Save Hamilton House campaign. Um, thanks. <laughs> just want to say, um, yeah, massive thank you for inviting us here today. Um, and a massive thank you to everyone who's already supported the campaign so far. It's really, really amazing. We're really appreciative. Um, I guess my question was, um, as a representative of that, but also just as a concerned citizen who feels really disempowered at the moment, um, it links in with what you, what you were saying earlier about, about universities and about landlords and about sort of living within this system and trying to work within these parameters that are so hard to break out of. Um, I'm really interested in what you were saying, Peter, about the, you know, the, di the difference between organizing on the ground and actually you sort of waiting for change to come from above. And at the moment, we're running this campaign and we're doing loads and loads of stuff on the ground. But at the end of the day, all of the power is with these landlords who own our building and they can choose to sell it to us or they can choose to just ignore the bids that we put together. And we're doing all this stuff on the ground, but it feels like this impossible task because at the end of the day, people just say, well, it's their building, they can do what they want. And so I'm really interested what your thoughts are and what we can do as a collective in this room now, what practical steps can we take mm. to um, achieve the impossible and actually bring that building into community ownership. Thank you. Do you know, uh, George, what, uh, what um, Hamilton House is? No. I just wondered. So in, correct I'm me if I'm... I'm yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I shouldn't have... Sorry, I shouldn't have, I shouldn't have asked that like that. No, I mean, my understanding is it, it, was, it was a building with masses of different community organisations which were either mm -hmm. given with cheap or, or, mm -hmm. or lower rent and um, which allowed a whole mass of fantastic community projects um, uh, to, to take place. And now its ownership is, is about to change. Does, well, mm. does the owner now sell it because they want to knock it down and, and, and do something um, you know, in a more conventional way? Well, well, under the current legal framework, which um, with my group of people, we're um, working to look at what policies we need to change that. Um, legally, obviously, there's not a lot you can do in a situation like this. But politically, there's a great deal yeah. you can do. And it is amazing how 
politics changes the application of law. And you make a big enough fuss, you get enough people out on the street, um, you, you basically put enormous pressure on the council, um, and you know, I know, you know, uh, who knows who these people are, maybe they're sort of some sort of offshored entity based in the Cayman Islands, I've no idea whatsoever, so they might be very hard to reach, but sometimes, just sometimes, people feel the reputational risk here is too great, and we're going to back off. Do, do, can I just ask you, do you know who the beneficial owners are? Yes, so the owner is a property developer called Connolly and Callaghan, right. and they're based in Bristol. Um, and they're based in Bristol. They're so based in the same, they're based in Hamilton House. We right, see them every okay. day. So, so, so yeah. these are real people. Well, these are real people. Well, that that's we a know. great start. That's a yeah. great start. Um, I mean, <laughs> uh, have you got a sympathetic local press on this issue? Um, we, yeah, we did get a lot of press recently, a couple of weeks ago, yeah. we ran an amazing um, Save Hamilton House campaign, ran an incredible march in Bristol, um, we had over a thousand people out on the street, so we got a lot of local media coverage, we got one story in The Guardian from that, um, and off the back of that we had uh, the, the Mayor of Bristol, Marvin Rees, um, and the Deputy Mayor, Asha Craig, have got in touch, they called us up late on a Friday night and said, you know, we'd love to support you um, in a very non-committal way, no promises, but, you know, we'll do whatever we can. And have you got any dialogue with the owners? Are um, they talking to you? I mean, you might be able to... You, Thomas has just been in a meeting with them right now, so you might be able to speak to that better than me. <laughs> this has put me on the spot. Um, <laughs> it's, we have this constant uh, catch-22 where on one side... Uh, they need the finances, as they say, to refurbish the building um, and the security of us paying the lease. We can't afford that because it's dependent on us having a 10-year lease in the first place, and it's dependent on uh, grant funding and other charity, charity organization grants and similar. And there's that disconnect between what we would be able to do and what we need to be able to do it, which is a 10-year lease, so we can invest and create that opportunity, and what their requirements are, which is essentially that we have this already in place before we even start to then sign a 10-year lease. And there's this impasse we have constantly. Have you looked at crowdfunding to raise the money to be able to uh, buy the 10-year lease? We did... Um, I'll answer this one. Um, we did a bid to buy the building last year, um, and that was turned down, um, and that was based on, in part on crowdfunding and financing through... Uh, various uh, funding sources, um, but ultimately it's their decision not to have sold it to us. So we have this constant battle um, of how to make something or bring it into community ownership if there's just reluctance. Hmm. And, and is there a, media, uh, a sort of a, a step where you just get the lease rather than buying the building, which you could crowdfund for? Would that be l less in terms of raising impact investment and really? Um, you know, because, I mean, I have a niece who lives in Middlesbrough who'd heard of the Republic of Stokes Croft and Hamilton House, and she's like, oh, this is it. You know, I mean, it goes far beyond, the value of it goes far beyond Stokes Croft. I, I mean, right. if Bristol, if anywhere, if, if, if it's going to be done, it can be done here. Yeah. It just feels that this, it has to happen here. And I just wonder if there's an impact investment uh, fundraise that can happen rather than buying the building, maybe as a, a short-term step, just to even get the lease for another five years, so you've got time to gather and, and look at it again. Is that something? We, of course, we, we try um, as many avenues as there are open to us. One of the things that we have, which is the, because there's such a wide community in the building and we have the scale of a very large building, the interconnection between all those groups is very valuable and very resourceful for a lot of people. Scale is a, a really important thing and yet, that value is, is not reflected in finances. Value there, the social capital, social, social currency, social capital, it's all there. It's been fostered over 10 years. So we, we don't have access to convert that to finances to, to then generate um, a lease that's suitable for them. Now, um, a share funding option, um, grant funding, we've, we've looked at these, but it's their choice ultimately, it's their building. And we, we have this impasse of not meeting what they exactly need. Yeah. Okay. Well, one last thing, uh, yeah. a char a Charitable Bonds by Alia. Alia have looked at how you actually uh, reflect the value 
of, um, for example, uh, prisoners not going back to prison or care. And they look at the value of these interrelationships and the value on the wider community. And I think they've raised over 200 million pounds, helped charities raise over 200 million pounds in charitable bonds. So I just wonder if that's another thing to look at. And I can give you a contact there um, if that's something you, you would like to look at after yes, the, please. Yeah. yeah. Thank Good. You. So do, do have those connections. And I think the, the, the guy who's going to talk um, or speak in a moment, Jay, may also have some thoughts on this. I mean, I felt it was worth us having a bit of a longer conversation on that because it's so much something that's live and for you. But I can't help feeling with whatever we are, 200 people in the room, there are probably also people in, in the room who, who may know someone who might know someone who may be able to help these guys. Because it's a really interesting project and it's much more than that because it's... A, it's it's, it's what's happening all over the place. So it's, a, it's also a, a precedent that can be hugely useful. Jay, there. And then we'll take, uh, where, and actually tell you what, I wouldn't mind going somewhere far back. Uh, hang on half a second, Jay. Yeah, this lady there. And then we're gonna end at that point after you, so you can have the final word. Don't say that Jeremy Corbyn's gonna solve everything, because I'll give you the same answer as, as um, uh, Khan did. Jay. Okay, hello. Um, He's not, because that was going to be my question. No, just a joke. Uh, I'm an immigrant from, from California. I live in Totnes. I'm involved in a few different things. So I'd be happy to talk with you guys if you want to about um, things that I'm part of. DART, there's the charter process that's going, which is a practical step. Um, I'm involved with something called the Reconomy Project. I'm involved with something called Control Shift, Emergency Summit for Change. We just had our first event in March on the anniversary of Article 50, the Brexit uh, uh, process starting. We're gonna have our next emergency summit uh, this coming uh, March. And my question is about how do we build a, an effective movement for positive change? Because uh, this is, uh, it's, it hasn't really been addressed at this talk so far, but we have mentioned neoliberalism, 40 years of it. Um, and uh, the deindustrialization of those places that voted heavily Brexit. We've had 10 years of austerity, and uh, where's, the movement, where's the effective movement for positive change? There's lots of people doing things, lots of organizations and networks, but I guess my, uh, my uh, hypothesis is that we don't have one because whatever it is that we're doing isn't working, and the culture of change making is too London-centric and a little bit disconnected. There were so many uh, London-based uh, uh, sort of left progressive elites and uh, change makers and campaigners who were actually surprised. So I'm just wondering uh, okay. about your thoughts about how we, can, how we can get past that and get into a new culture of ch around change making and build a movement that will actually make some headway. Thank you. Well, I, I think that might have been a more valid question a couple of years ago, but what I see happening right now, I mean, I'm not saying it's not a valid question today because it is and you expressed it beautifully, but you know, what I see happening is exactly this taking place within the labor grassroots. Now, I'm not a party person, I've never been a member of any party, um, but I see a huge part of the problem as having been that the Labour Party, which was supposed to be the vehicle for that mass mobilization of working and indeed middle class people against the oligarchs, just wasn't fulfilling that role. And there was a long period under Blair and Brown where it became just another outlet for neoliberalism. Sure, you know, softened, not nearly as virulent as the neoliberalism of the Conservative Party, but broadly speaking, a neoliberal party nonetheless. And so it deprived people of that forum for mass mobilization where you know, the Labour Party was the obvious place. Without it, we were kind of at sea. But it seems to me, whatever you think about the particular personalities involved and whatever you think about um, particular policies and positions that it's taken, what we see happening here is a national mass movement regenerating once more, through which there's a potential, isn't always fulfilled as yet, but I think there's a long, long way to go to start articulating a whole load of the things that we're interested in. And the way in which Labour now seems to be keen on this radical devolution of power 
and are becoming once more a party driven by its grassroots, and interestingly in this case, not exclusively by the trade union grassroots, but by people mobilizing outside the workplace as well, because the workplace is a much less hospitable place for mobilization than it used to be, as we don't get the fixed workforce in, in very large workplaces, very large factories and the rest of it which can mobilize together, but people are disaggregated, zero hour contracts, hot desking, um, all, all the rest of it, um, false freelancing, the gig economy, all that makes the workplace a very difficult place to organize, but they're looking way beyond that. And I think we're seeing the stirrings of exactly this mass mobilization. Now what we, as people with a particular concern, as I expect a lot of people in this audience have, with environmental issues have to do, is to start injecting some of that green thinking into the mass mobilization. Because at the moment, labor are not switched on to environmental issues. But the vehicle is now there. It has returned, and I feel we have a duty to make use of it. Thank you. Can so, I, okay. the last question is the woman in the middle there. Um, thank you. So, this evening, we've talked a lot about capitalism, the celebrity culture, education, as um, things that exist as separate from us. And the first thing I'd like to say is, are they not, isn't the world that we've created a product of our collective mind? And can we use those things as a means, as, as a force for good? Wendy and I were having a, a discussion in the break about Sadhguru, who's a, who's a visionary and a mystic. And he has just, he's done just that in India. He started a campaign called Rally for Rivers last September. And it's turned into the, the, the biggest global environmental campaign with over 200 million people signing up to it in India and, and planting millions of trees. And he's done just that through tapping into those, those kind of, you know, those co corporations, celebrity culture and so on. And I, and I, and I wonder if, if we could do that as well, uh, you know, as, as part of our thinking. Thank you. Hmm. I, Quick comments? It's, yeah. It, um, I, I think it's answer, I think that just in response to both of those questions, I think it's the same thing, is that it has to be this, sh there is a shift. It started to happen. There's a, lots of this is converging. And, um, and you see, I mean, India is so wonderful and magic and chaotic and challenging, but they believe, we were, we were saying that there's a belief in, in themselves that they are empowered. And I think that's the thing. From the moment we walk into school begins the journey of disempowerment. And um, actually we have to believe that we are empowered to do just that. So when we look at policies or when we look at things that need doing, rather than saying, well, the local authority aren't doing it, well, let's do it and take it to the local authority. So take it home, bring it back. And so I would say that the solutions already exist. We know what they are. We have to question what the barriers are that prevent those solutions being implemented. And if it's mass mobilization, then let's look at how we do that. If it's just me stopping eating meat, or if it's me just changing a, a, a car, um, then why aren't I? So it's right back, it comes right back from the personal, why am I not doing this, right through to whatever level you're working at. There are, the, the solutions are there, and I think mass mobilization has begun. And morphic resonance, you know, we, we can be uh, the change that we want to see in the world. We must be the change that we want to see in the world. Thank you. Do you want to say something? Go on. I would really like it if we could follow some of the inspiration that are given us from indigenous peoples who take care of over 80% of the world's biodiversity. I think that all of our systems, our education, our political structures, um, our businesses, our business plans, um, all of them need to be assessed with uh, the earth and the earth's community at their core. And are they a benefit to the Earth's community? Are they a benefit to the planet in terms of the environmental impact that they have? And if they're not, then they need to be reassessed and you know, supported so that they can get back and to reorganize themselves in such a way as what they are is nurturing the planet. And I think that's really simple and it's really massive amount of work and we can all get involved in that in all sorts of different forms and systems and businesses and groups. Thank you. The, the, question, <coughs> the question you asked was, is this not the world that we have created? And I would say probably by and large it is not the world that we have created. 
It is a world that has been created by an oligarchy. An oligarchy which um, exercises its greatest power through the media, but through all sorts of other means as well, um, through corporate structure, through government structure, through, um, uh, the, the, uh, through hierarchies um, of all kinds, various kinds of social hierarchy. And to a very large extent, we have been left out of this process. <laughs> and our role as citizens is to take back control, not in the way that Leave UK mean, uh, means it, but to, <laughs> to, to, to genuinely take back control. And this takes us back to the very beginning of the conversation and the need for a grassroots resurgence, a grassroots renaissance where we co-create our world. We co-produce our world. And we do so by developing community where community is lacking, developing communion where communion is lacking. Developing connection where connection is lacking. Expressing our full potential as empathetic, altruistic, engaged and community-minded human beings. And we are wild outliers as far as animal species are concerned by having all that in spades more than any other animal species has. But, and this is a measure of the extent to which we have not created this world, it has been suppressed. Because despite the fact that we are such an altruistic and empathetic species, we allow psychopaths to govern us. And that is what needs to change. We have to govern ourselves, and we do it from the bottom up. Thank you. Thank you.